When it comes to living things, there are but two great kingdoms that tend to come to mind. The one to which we ourselves belong, the animals, the creatures that roam the lands, swim the seas and soar the skies above. And the plants, the lungs of the earth, and the source of so much of nature's beauty and serenity. But there exists another kingdom, neither animal nor plant, that is for the most part a much more cryptic entity, yet is every bit as prevalent as the plants and animals we see all around us. Within the trunks and beneath the roots of the great forest trees, beneath the logs and dead leaves that pile up as the years go by, perhaps beneath your feet at this very moment, is the domain of a third kingdom, the fungi. And this is how they spend most of their existence, as a nondescript network of filaments called the mycelium, meandering through soil and rotting debris, breaking down organic matter and returning vital nutrients to the earth. But as the storm clouds gather, and the ground is smote by the first drops of the watery deludes descending from above, things start to change for some fungi. For it is under these conditions that many reproduce, and when that time comes, they reveal themselves to be every bit as glamorous, enthralling, and at times utterly bewildering as the animals and plants. Bursting forth from secrecy are these spectacular structures, sporocarps or fruiting bodies. While the mycelium represents the main body of a fungus, these ephemeral apparitions are vaguely analogous to the fruits or flowers of a plant, their sole purpose being to set seed to a new generation. Well, maybe set seed isn't the most suitable phrase, for unlike the overwhelming majority of plants, fungi reproduce not via seeds, but spores. Minuscule in size and produced in astronomical quantities, Fungal spores are small and light enough to be borne aloft by the faintest of breezes, and can be carried far and wide. The incredible forms exhibited by sporocarps are all adaptations for aiding this process, the classic mushroom shape being an excellent example. Here the spores are released from the underside of the cap. This fertile, spore-bearing surface, known as the hymenium, often has a complex structure, consisting of gills, wrinkles, or pores, which increases the surface area of the hymenium, allowing a greater quantity of spores to be produced and held by any one sporocarp. A stem-like structure, called a stipe, elevates the hymenium above the substrate, increasing the likelihood that any spores shed will be picked up by a breeze and transported away from the parent fungus. Such a simple, familiar shape yet so wondrously efficient at performing its function. But this is by no means the only way that fungi can facilitate the dispersal of their spores. Earth star fungi, like these Geastrum saccata, hold their spores inside a rounded sac, and when external pressure is applied, such as from a raindrop or a falling leaf, the spores are forcibly ejected through the opening at the apex. While these and many other fungi make use of the air to spread their spores, there are a few that have more unique and complex methods of achieving this universal goal. Among them is a group that has captured my fascination ever since I was a child, a source of intrigue, wonder, and at times no small amount of obsession. They are among the strangest and most otherworldly of all fungi with a less than flattering name that, while apt, does them little justice in my opinion. They are the Stinkhorns. Stinkhorns, along with a few close relatives, belong to an order of fungi called the Phalalis. While this taxonomic placement is fairly well established, their classification at the family level is a little more disputed. Some publications have stinkhorns all forming a single family called the Phalaceae. In others, they are split into two families, Phalaceae for unbranched forms, and Clathraceae for branched and latticed forms. A third family, the Lysuraceae, exhibiting forms that are visually intermediate between those of the Phalaceae and Clathraceae, has also been proposed, 
though in most cases the species within this group tend to be regarded as part of the Calathraceae as opposed to their own distinct family. Bottom line is, taxonomy can be a befuddling discipline, and as it currently stands, there appears to be no clear-cut consensus on the family-level classification of stinkhorns. These fungi exhibit an incredible array of forms, each as bizarre as the last. Yet in spite of this variety, there are a couple common traits that unite these incredible fungi. Spectacular as their appearances often are when mature, the fruiting bodies of stinkhorns upon first clearing the subterranean realm are unremarkable in the extreme. Immature sporocarps are rounded and egg-like in appearance, typically ranging from off-white to brown, sometimes with purplish tinges. At this stage, they can be easily mistaken for other fungi, namely puffballs, but not long after they become very difficult to confuse with anything else. The egg will soon rupture, and the spore-bearing receptacle arises rapidly, sometimes at speeds of up to 5mm per minute. This is not, in the proper sense, growth, for no new cells are being formed, all cellular development having been completed during the egg stage. Instead, its swift expansion is purely mechanical, the result of water being absorbed by the mushroom. Another uniting feature of stinkhorns is their unique method of spore dispersal. Rather than being passively released into the air like those of many other fungi, the spores of stinkhorns are contained within a dark gelatinous mass known as the gleba. While fairly firm in the egg stage, when the sporocarp matures, the gleba liquefies, and begins to release an odour that could at best be described as unsavoury. It is from this, of course, that these fungi derive their common name. The stench that emanates from the glebal slime is a magnet for carrion feeding insects, namely flies, and as they move all over the sporocarp, they inevitably become coated in the fungus's spores thus becoming airborne transportation vessels for the next generation of stinkhorns. So, now let's take a look at some of the more common and familiar species local to the greater Brisbane area, the region that I call home. We'll start with what is perhaps the most basic in terms of appearance and frequency of encounter, Phallus rubicundus. This is one of the most regularly observed stinkhorns in Australia, and they are plentiful here in Brisbane. Indeed, as I speak right now, their vivid red sporocarps are erupting en masse, just a minute or so down the road. The genus name Phallus is something I'd rather not explain in too much detail lest this video get demonetised. I'll just say it's based off a particular aspect of the mushroom's appearance that the more dirty-minded of us are bound to have noticed already. But hey, it's not like I have the cleanest sense of humour either, especially after listening to too much of a certain comedian. Ah, 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 ah. Anyway, back on topic. Phallus rubicundus often appears in enormous numbers after rain, particularly on wood chip mulch, a substrate favoured by many stinkhorns, and can be readily identified based off its slender, cylindrical stipe and, above all else, striking pink to red coloration. While at times difficult to make out, this species does possess a conical cap separate from the stipe, upon which the gleba is born. This feature distinguishes it from the members of the genus Mutinus, many of which are superficially similar in overall appearance but lack a distinct cap. When the spore-laden fluid is removed, either by the elements or insects, the cap is revealed to be somewhat granular in texture, and every bit as vibrantly coloured as the stipe. Almost as abundant in Australia is Phallus multicolour. This somewhat fancier relative of Phallus rubicundus seems to have tried to mask its offensively phallic appearance with an intricate netted veal known as an indusium. Can't say it was especially successful, but I guess it's the effort put in that counts. Jokes aside, the actual function of the veal is likely acting as a sort of ladder to allow the fungus's insect couriers easier access to the spore-covered cap. 
Unlike the relatively smooth cap of Phallus rubicundus, the cap of Phallus multicolor is heavily pitted, giving it a somewhat honeycomb-esque appearance. The coloration of these fungi can vary somewhat, hence the species name multicolor. The cap most typically ranges from yellow to orange, with the stipe exhibiting similar coloration, albeit usually substantially paler. The indusium tends to be of similar colour to the stipe, though it may have a slight pinkish hue. This species has a sickly, sweet odour that, from my experience, is more readily detectable from a distance when compared to that of many other stinkhorns. While the odours of most stinkhorn species I've come across are something I'd barely notice unless I deliberately bent down and took a whiff, Phallus multicolour is something I'd quite easily smell before seeing, to the point that I could actually seek them out like a strange bipedal sniffer dog that retired from its job in security to pursue a lifelong passion for mushroom hunting. As a sort of compensation for its strength, the odour emanating from Phallus multicolour isn't quite as overtly foul as that of many other stinkhorns. Though at the same time, I can't see them being used as substitutes for flower bouquets and air fresheners just yet. Similar in appearance, though a somewhat rarer find this far south, is Phallus indusiatus. The sporocarps of this species strongly resemble those of Phallus multicolor in terms of overall form, though they are uniformly white in coloration and tend to have a longer veal. Phallus indusiatus has a circumtropical distribution, and has been recorded not only here in Australia, but Asia, Africa, and the Americas. However, recent research has suggested that the taxonomy of this species may be a little more complex than it meets the eye, as the diagnostic features provided in the species' original description are rather limited and likely insufficient for differentiating it from the numerous similar stinkhorns that can be found across the globe, leading to Phallus indusiatus being a sort of blanket name for white-billed stinkhorns, thus obscuring the true diversity that very probably exists. And given the variation in the fungus's morphology across its broad range, Phallus indusiatus may very well represent multiple different species lumped under the same name. Now let's move on to the branched stinkhorns. First up, Lysurus moccasin, a very widespread and common species that also happens to be the first stinkhorn I ever saw in the flesh. At first glance, this species is something that can be quite easily mistaken for Phallus rubicundus with its long, pink stipe and glebe-covered tip. But upon closer inspection, key differences become apparent. First of all, the stipe of Lysurus moccasin terminates not in a cap, but in several short, wrinkled arms. These arms are orange in colour, and are typically fused at the apex, though they may separate in old or weathered specimens. The gleba occupies the furrows between the arms, initially masking much of their surface. In addition, the stipe possesses distinctive vertical ridges that give it a somewhat polygonal cross-section, a feature that serves to distinguish Lysurus moccasin not just from Phallus rubicundus, but from every other stinkhorn species that I'm aware of. That's about it with the stinkhorns whose morphology has me worried about this video getting age-restricted. The last couple species I'll be covering don't really look like nature's attempts at subjecting casual bushwalkers to indecent exposure, but if anything, they're even more otherworldly in appearance. Next in line is a species that holds the honour of being the first fungus ever recorded in Australia, Acero rubra. This remarkable species has a cosmopolitan distribution, and in Australia, tends to be most common along the eastern coast, as well as Tasmania, where the first specimens of the fungus were collected. Acero rubra's broad range can, at least in part, be attributed to the exportation of soil products around the world, though its presence in more remote locations, such as various regions in Africa and the Pacific, is rather less explainable by human endeavours. 
Of course, while humans have been excellent unintentional allies when it comes to propagating this fungus's spread, like other stinkhorns, Acerorubra evolved to be distributed not by humans, but by insects. The genus name Acero translates to mean disgusting juice, a likely reference to the Gleba, with the species name Rubra meaning red, which I don't think I need to explain. Mature sporocarps consist of a pale pink cylindrical stipe that varies in height, ranging from being barely visible above the substrate to over 10 centimetres high. As is the norm for stinkhorns, the stipe is hollow and spongy in texture. Atop the stipe is a ring of bright pink to red bifurcated tentacles radiating out from a central disc. The gleba covers much of the disc when fresh, as well as the very bases of the arms. The arms exhibit a rather substantial degree of variability, in terms of number, length, and the extent to which they are forked. Sometimes there is only a slight split toward the tip of each arm, and in other instances they are forked almost all the way to the base. However, while the proportions of the arms may differ markedly between separate specimens, the tentacles on any one sporocarp will always be of roughly similar form. Though this plasticity in appearance ensures no two acerorubra will look exactly the same, the species remains so distinctive that there's little room for misidentification regardless. Finally, we come to what I'd probably say is my personal favourite out of the ensemble I've presented in this video, though that is admittedly a very tight contest. This is Colus pusillus, a fungus most commonly observed here in Australia, though its range does extend to other localities such as India. It's a somewhat regular site on my university campus, and I may have ended up late to a couple lectures while recording some of the footage for this video. Like many of its relatives, Colus pusillus has a propensity for popping up on wood chip mulch and its vibrant coloration combined with its intriguing form make outbursts of these fungi quite the spectacle, possibly even garnering the attention of those who ordinarily wouldn't have so much as a cursory glance spared for mushrooms. Colus pusillus possesses numerous arms that branch and fuse to form an intricate latticed structure. These arms are narrow, heavily wrinkled and bright red in colour, though they become paler and slightly thicker towards the base. The stipe of the mushroom is extremely short, and even at maturity, seldom rises clear of the egg remnants at the base of the sporocarp. While the gleba of many other stinkhorns is confined to a specific region of the fruiting body, in Colus pusillus, the spore-laden slime is smeared unevenly throughout pretty much the entire inner surface of the lattice, barring the portions closest to the stipe. A fresh, well-formed specimen of Colus pusillus is a marvellous sight to behold, but the opportunity to see such an apparition is brief. The lattice is extremely soft and delicate, and after only a few hours, even less on a clear, sunny day, the whole structure will keel over and begin to disintegrate. So that's just about it for this video. Needless to say, the content of today's upload was rather unusual for my channel, definitely a bit of a wild card, but at the same time I hope you appreciated it nonetheless. And if you'd like to see more fungi content, then please let me know. There are some amazing fungi around this area, and I would absolutely love to share them all with you if you're interested. If you enjoyed this video, then feel free to check out some of my other uploads as well. And of course, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any future content. Thank you all very much for watching. I shall see you again very soon.